Okay, this is Dr. Fred Heinzel, and I'm going to be talking about leprosy, one of our most honored and uh, uh, forms of infectious disease dating back to antiquity. So the learning objectives for this talk today is to understand the epidemiology and pathophysiology of human infection with Mycobacterium libri. Also, to appreciate the spectral presentations of both tuberculoid and permanent leprosy in this disease, to formulate a treatment plan tailored for different forms of leprosy, and to understand, monitor, and treat the complications of leprosy therapy. Leprosy in history has, uh, um, has been known since uh, biblical time when uh, patients with leprosy were de declared unclean and banished from society. In medieval Europe, uh, they were often declared legally dead um, and could not live with their family anymore. Uh, Muhammad had argued that uh, lepers uh, were, were a serious risk and uh, everyone should flee lepers as if from a lion. In the 1900s, uh, they had to wear cowbells around the neck. Uh, patients were eventually confined to leposoriums in the mid-1900s. Uh, and curative chemotherapy, fortunately, became available uh, in, in the 1940s. Okay, so this is really a disease with two distinct components. One is a chronic mycobacterial infection, which presents as a spectral disease determined by distinct cellular immune responses. The most important thing about this is that this mycobacterial infection is curable, absolutely. <coughs> However, the other disease associated with mycobacterium infection is a disabling peripheral neuropathy. This persists long after cure of infection. It is associated with lifelong physical disability and lifelong social and psychological stigmata. This is usually not curable. Okay, first off, this is a mycobacterial infection of the skin. And so most of the manifestations <laughs> in the stage of disease relate to the lesions on the skin. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is uh, a patient that has probably a borderline uh, le lepromonous leprosy. Um, and the pointer doesn't work, of course. So what you're looking at here are these round circles of, of discolored tissue. Uh, in a darker skin patient, they tend to be lighter. On a, dark, on a lighter skin patient, they tend to be darker. Most of these are circular in nature. And that these are pretty typical for uh, uh, the skin uh, um, uh, infections of, of leprosy. Okay. Uh, underneath those, those lesions, if you were to biopsy that and then stain with an acid fast stain, this is what you would see. And these are basically buckets of acid fast bacilli, mycobacteria. Uh, compared to other mycobacteria, what is the hallmark characteristic of leprosy? If you were to put these into culture, what would happen? They grow slowly? Really slow? Okay, and I don't know. Okay. Um, the hallmark here is Mycobacterium uh, leprae does not grow in any culture medium. Uh, it only grows inside tissue at a certain temperature. And we'll go through that a little more. So, Mycobacterium leprae, unusual organism. Acid fast bacillus, it's an obligate intracellular pathogen. It does not grow in bacteriologic media or tissue culture. Uh, it is highly temperature restricted. It grows slowly in human tissue that's uh, less than 37 degrees. Uh, if it's warmer than that, it doesn't grow at all. The doubling time is about 14 days, which is one of the longest doubling times uh, for any pathogenic bacteria. It uh, it can be shed and it can remain viable in the environment for several days. I'll talk more about that later. And it has a very restricted host range, consisting of humans and nine banded armadillos, by the way, which are the armadillos you see out in your lawn early in the morning uh, and, and that dig those nice little conical pits in your, your front yard. Um, the humans and nine banded armadillos are infected with exactly the same strain of M. Lepre. So there's no specificity uh, for uh, uh, emulibrate for one host or the other. Okay. Okay. Um, so what should have been there? I think it was just a little another description saying it does not grow in culture. So why would this bacteria that fails to grow in culture 
um, why would it want to have an intracellular uh, lifestyle? Take advantage of the intracellular. Right. And the reason for this is if you compare the tuberculosis bacteria, which has 4.4 megabases, um, the genome of the leprosy vessels is much smaller, 3.27 megabases. And what that represents is massive gene decay. This has happened in a lot of organisms. If you're going to chlamydia and some other organisms that are intracellular pathogens, they usually do that because they've, they've shed a lot of DNA that they don't need anymore. It makes them a little more efficient, but they have to live inside a cell. So massive gene uh, deletion, loss of gene function, repeated recombination, repetitive sequences. I mean, it's one very seriously messed up genome. Um, because of this, these organisms cannot make Certain, uh, they can't maintain certain metabolic activities. Um, they fail to uh, import siderophore precursors, and their catabolism, oxidative metabolism, and respiratory chain intermediates are also uh, uh, deficient. So in order to work around that, this metabolically challenged, or challenged organism steals uh, um, uh, uh, basically um, uh, uh, food sources, energy sources, ATP and ADPH, from the cell itself. And it's not, it's not atypical for that. Other organisms do that. The other thing that's very unusual about leprosy is that it has neurotrophic behavior. There's not a lot of organisms that specifically target to the nerve. The Lassa fever is one of them. So, and there's a molecular basis for this. Uh, and um, M. Libri, uh binds to the Schwann cell membrane. The way it does this is that uh, it uh, initially interacts with these uh, uh, basement membrane uh, protein components called laminins, and, uh, which are necessary for sort of the cytoskeleton of the outer part of the cell. They bind to that, but then the laminin, by its nature of how it works on the cell surface, binds to a protein called alpha dystroglycan. Now, this is a protein that its major role just seems to be to help define polarity in a Schwann cell membrane. And so it sticks out, and that sort of allows the cell to kind of figure out which way it wants to do things. The laminin binds to alpha dystroglycan, and it is actually taken up into the cell, and therefore the uh, M. Lepery bacillus uh, gets into the cell and starts to cause trouble. Okay, again, it's an organism that uh, prefers intracellular lifestyle. And what we're looking at over here, here is a peripheral nerve, and you've got multiple packets of nerves here, most of which are myelinated. You see from the, um, the little darkish circle there, that is all of the myelin. And look over on the upper right-hand side, we're looking at a cross-section of an axon on the upper left, and the very dark uh, area is also myelin. Myelin is there for a reason. It basically acts like a... Um, it's, like, it's like insulation on a wire. Uh, in order for those axons to work, there's a nerve potential. It conducts forward at a certain velocity. Um, if there was no barrier between it and the rest of the cell, all of these ions that, are, that, that constitute the nerve uh, action potential would be flying off into the rest of the body, and you wouldn't really have very efficient transmission. So um, myelinated uh, nerves tend to have very high nerve conduction velocities. If you disrupt the myelin, which is actually uh, produced by the Schwann cell where it wraps around these axons, if, if that uh, Schwann cell is diseased because it has bacteria in it, uh, the myelin suffers and you lose uh, uh, nerve uh, conduction velocity and the nerve itself may die. Okay, so that explains the neural trophism of M. Lipari. It also gives you sort of a heads up on how the neuropathology becomes a prominent part of this disease, the part of the disease that can't be treated. Okay, so epidemiology is, is really very interesting. Um, for, for years, no one really knew how leprosy got transmitted. Uh, the, over the last uh, 15 years or so, there, there's been some uh, enough epidemiologic study um, looking at uh, this issue that it's now thought that we, we know it's a rural disease of underdeveloped localities. Uh, the risk of developing leprosy in a household is typically associated with a household member who at some point had had leprosy. 
although plenty of people seem to get leprosy without any defined exposure. There are oddball cases. Uh, contact of armadillos is always much discussed. There are exceedingly few examples of humans acquiring uh, uh, leprosy from armadillos, so we'll just dismiss that for now. Question? Yes. Um, I had a conversation with one of our um, one of our staff here mm -hmm. who used to, I think, train in the Louisiana area, mm -hmm. and he said that um, there used to be a cluster of, of uh, leprosy cases in, in rural Louisiana because of the practice some people had of Oh, eating armadillos. Yeah. You heard that before? I think you told that to me before. Um, is there a paper or is there? No, I'm not aware of. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called biller hunting. Biller <laughs> hunting. <laughs> armadillos. Oh, I just created that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> moving on. Um, now, the other thing about the epidemiology that's very important is that because this takes 14 days to double, uh, the incubation time until you actually see definable disease is exceedingly long, probably in the order of five years. Some people don't develop uh, leprosy until 40 years after what might have been an exposure. Um, part of the reason it takes so long is not just the doubling rate, but it takes a huge bacillary load to actually generate disease. It turns out that Mycobacterium malipari is not terribly inflammatory. It's not like MTB. You don't really develop infection with, with massive granulomas and everything. Um, instead, uh, it, it can be a, sort of a stealth infection. So for several reasons, it takes a long time to recognize the disease. When you see it, most of these patients have already expanded their <coughs> bacterial load up to fairly high levels uh, without any, uh, and sometimes without a whole lot of evidence of, from just by looking at the skin. Okay, so uh, this disease is prevalent throughout the world. This is a, a WHO uh, a picture here. And uh, where you have red are very high prevalence rates for leprosy in India and Brazil and Madagascar are, are, have always been on, high on the list here. Um, you got different colors in there as well. Uh, obviously, there's a lot in Southern uh, America. But uh, we also have indigenous uh, acquisition of leprosy in the United States. And this has been going on for over maybe 200, possibly 300 years. Um, and uh, it, it, typically, it's, it's in the southern states of the United States. Um, sometimes California. So uh, in California, they do have uh, leprosy clinics, and they get new patients on a regular basis. They're not always from the Pacific, from the Pacific Rim. Many of them are actually uh, been born and raised in California. Same with Louisiana and parts of Florida as well. So it is uh, a disease you can acquire in the United States. It's just very rare, and uh, but uh, something that's there. <clears throat> so let's talk about the clinical spectrum of leprosy. Um, there, there are two major forms. One that results in <clears throat> uh, partial control of the bacterial load. There, there is some evidence of an effective immune response. It's on the left-hand side there under tuberculoid. So it's posse bacillary, which means few ba ba bacteria. And you can actually do skin slits, and you can actually stain the bacteria, and you can make some estimation of how many bacteria are there. And that correlates, if it's 10 to the 6 bacilli per body, which is obviously a very, very small number, then there's effective immunity. Effective immunity is probably interferon gamma mediated, probably TNF mediated, and these are things that correlate with development of a skin test. It's uh, such as like a PPD, for instance. And so the there is a test um, for uh, it's a Perlman um, test that can uh, uh, be positive if there has been previous exposure to to leprosy. It doesn't always predict disease, mind you. Um, <clears throat> in this situation, when there's active immunity, you see granulomas, you see caseous and necrosis, and they will often heal spontaneously. So your immune system is polarizing to be protective against this organism, along the way generating granulomas in a positive skin test. On the right-hand side, we have multibacillary disease, and this is really more along the lepromatous spectrum of, of this disease, and that means you have huge number of bacilli, and uh, it's not unusual to see patients with 10 to the 9th bacilli per gram. Something like 20 to 30 percent of the weight of the tissue is actually the bacteria itself, with all of its lipids and uh, 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 bacterial coats. Under that circumstance, you develop energy. Uh, the host seems to lose its ability to use T cells to kill the bacteria, and instead what happens is you lose your T cell 
your peripheral T cell respond. In other words, the um, a skin test reaction is negative. <coughs> and as you look at the tissues, you start to see uh, macrophages without granulomas. It's thought that granulomas actually represent a, a more of a, a better is better adapted to killing the bacteria. But when you get into multivascular uh, disease, eventually you use granulomas. You hardly even see activated macrophages anymore. Um, and it rarely resolves without prolonged therapy. It's a very hard disease to treat. So here's, just to give you a better idea of that, looking at the histology on the top, you have H and E of uh, skin biopsies here. On the left-hand side, TT means tuberculoid. So that's where you should see granulomas. And yes, you do see granulomas at the very bottom there, kind of got the clear centers, which are the, the large foamy macrophages, ringed by uh, uh, lymphocytes, which of course are darker and more numerous. So, and underneath that, you have a picture of a granuloma. It's an um, acid fast stain, a tissue acid fast stain. What is it, the white stain? Forget. Um, and you see a little bit of red there. So there's one lonely mycobacterium there. As you start moving this way towards the permanent leprosy, which is LL, you start seeing more and more bacteria to finally here, you have a big, you have these clusters of acid fast uh, bacilli, and you have absolutely no granulomas response. You just have sort of a diffuse infiltrate of macrophages um, some of which may actually be infected by leprosy as well. Again, the um, organism likes to go into cells. <clears throat> and then for this sort of biopsy here, if they don't grow, you basically have uh, a diagnosis of, uh, of, of leprosy because it's the only mycobacterium that causes disease but can't grow inside tissue culture or um, uh, a culture plate. Okay, so tuberculoid leprosy, in terms of diagnosis now, um, there, there are some definitions. Uh, first off, in tuberculoid leprosy, you expect to see macules, but they're, they're few in number. It should be between 1 and 10. And it gets kind of fuzzy at the upper border. But um, they're usually they're hypopigmented and they're anesthetic. And this is really characteristic. Um, even if they're hyperpigmented on whiter skin or, you know, hypopigmented on darker skin, you can take a pan, you can poke it in the middle of that, uh, uh, that macule, and most patients won't feel that. I've done this a couple times, and it's really pretty dramatic. You don't pop it right in there. There's just nothing. Um, they have raised or erythematous borders, uh, and uh, curiously, you can, in tuberculoid leprosy, um, in, actually, I'll come to this a little bit, but actually, it, sometimes you can actually find leprosy inside the uh, nasal pharynx, uh, but usually those are patients with higher loads, and I'll talk about that in just a few slides. That's another macula underneath uh, uh, the eye. Um, sometimes they're, they're, they're not all that obvious. Here's another one that's not obvious. It's a little serpentine uh, um, uh, perimeter there, um, possibly a little bit granulomatous. And here's somebody who had uh, leprosy. In, and you almost have to look at it on an angle, and you can kind of see those little roughened areas. And typically, uh, these lesions are there for, for months, even a year. Because again, this is a very slow moving disease. So if the lesions that have been there for a long, long time, you can poke it with a needle and they don't wince, uh, and that, that's very suspicious for leprosy, and then you can confirm it by using a skin biopsy with the acid pass stain. As you start moving across the spectrum towards permanent leprosy, you start seeing bigger macules. They tend to become, uh, you know, this is this isn't this is sort of borderline lepromatous right here. As you keep moving towards the lepromatous spectrum, you see more of these lesions. At some point, they begin to become symmetric on the uh, trunk. And I don't have a good picture of that, unfortunately. Um, you'll begin to see, it's almost like a butterfly-shaped uh, pattern where if there's some symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other part of uh, another manifestation of tuberculoid leprosy, again, now we're now talking about um, a very effective cell-mediated immunity, relatively small mycobacterial burden is because of that affinity to go into the nerve sheath, uh, patients with tuberculoid leprosy will often show hypertrophic nerves, sometimes post auricular nerves, uh, the perineal, perineal nerves. There's, um, there's, a, there's a variety of places where they can develop very thickened uh, nerves, but it's uh, you know, easily, uh, sometimes it feels like a, a small rope under the skin. And um, the reason that nerve is thickened is because it's being destroyed by an immune response. In this picture, you can see there's some granulomas. You can see pieces of uh, axon, or it looks like a myelin sheath, that are they're, just, they're all being attacked by lymphocytes. And so these patients will, tuberculoid leprosy patients, will develop 
peripheral neuropathies fairly aggressively once you, their immune response gets going. And again, here's another picture of a nerd that's all but destroyed with some huge uh, uh, Lagerhans granulomas in the middle of it. Okay, so lepromonas leprosy then, coming back again to that, that part of the spectrum, uh, you have many macular lesions, not regions. Um, they're symmetric, uh, you have nodules or plaques. The dermis is often very thickened. Uh, the warm skin areas are spared. Again, this is an organism that um, uh, likes to grow at temperatures of more like about 36, you know, well under 37 degrees. So um, it, the areas that are warmer, such as the scalp, midline of the back, and the axilla, um, you won't really see these lesions at all. Okay, uh, and then finally, the, the extreme version of lepromis leprosy is diffuse lepromatosis, which involves diffuse dermal involvement without discrete lesions, and eyebrows were lost entirely. This seems to be more common in parts of Mexico. Uh, you see it less commonly uh, overseas. <clears throat> Again, Mac is many a number symmetric. I think uh, I somehow duplicated that. Okay, so here we have a guy who actually has multiple nodules. You can see those on the nose. You can see that the chin is thickened. You got some papules. <laughs> the upper lip is 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 very thickened. That's um, and that's probably all bacteria looking at right there. You, you would if you were to actually open up one of those nodules, look at it, you'd, you'd see this huge number of spastic pass pass uh, And then eventually, it can cause uh, enough damage to the nose that actually the bridge in the nose can collapse. <clears throat> and also, it, it can form some very characteristic lesions in uh, the mandible and maxilla. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. This is evidence that leprosy was present in the United States in pre-Columbian times. This was a skull that was excavated, uh, I think, in northern Mexico. And where those arrows point, and I can't actually tell you exactly what the structures are there, but um, those arrows point to portions of bone, bone that are normally destroyed in patients who have uh, oral pharyngeal uh, leprosy uh, because the, bac the bacteria do seem to get into the bone and you, you can get uh, uh, some very characteristic lesions, not that I can describe them to you right now. And so this is evidence that in fact leprosy was there well below uh, Columbus's uh, voyage to the United States. And I, I think there's some other uh, uh, data to support that. Okay, so some other oddball things about lepromonas leprosy, the upper respiratory mucosa is involved granulomas and nasal collapse. You can get bacteria in blood. Again, uh, it's, um, uh, the organisms are probably not viable, but they exist in such large numbers, they just sort of spontaneously get into the blood. Um, you can occasionally see them on a blood smear, but they're never gonna grow. Uh, and they're probably not gonna survive because the blood temperature, of course, is higher than it would allow them to proliferate. Um, and you will see AFB smear positive in these patients. Um, if it doesn't grow, then it's not TB. Sometimes there's confusion about that. Um, for lepromonas leprosy, the pattern of neuropathy is very different. With uh, tuberculoid, it's very focal because it's, it's really just one area of the body that's involved, and it's very rapidly, it results in rapid destruction. Neuroinvolvement in lepromonas leprosy is symmetric. It's diffuse, tends to be very slowly progressive, although eventually they, will, uh, they can develop very profound stocking glove peripheral neuropathies. The nerves are not enlarged because this is not a disease mediated by granulomas infiltration, so you don't have these big thickened nerves. So almost two different diseases there. <clears throat> okay, and finally, because the scrotum of, of men is a relatively cool area, um, it's not common in areas with a lot of leprosy, lepromonas leprosy, to see men who have developed uh, gynecomastia, and that's due to the part that uh, <clears throat> the uh, testicles and androgenic synthetic potential of the testicles is, is markedly inhibited by the fact that they have uh, leprosy uh, in, in, in that area. Okay, so you get feminization. Okay, and the diagnosis I already said, if you have a skin biopsy, you see acid fast bacilli, nothing grows. Uh, and particularly if they have lesions that have been there for a long time, it's pretty much slam dunk uh, leprosy. It's not that, that hard to diagnose once you get to that point. Uh, you can do a slit skin smears and do a smear for acid fast, but um, it's, it's not much. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the differential diagnosis, one is cutaneous leishmaniasis, only because when you have disseminated cutaneous leishmaniasis, it sure looks like lepromonas leprosy. You get nodules, you get plaques, same sort of thing. It can be symmetric, multiple lesions. 
you biopsy that and use a right game sustain, and you will see uh, uh, the leishmania in the macrophages of the skin. So that's not very hard to distinguish. Syphilis, yaws, I haven't seen a lot. Um, it, the pictures look similar. I don't know. Does anyone? I suppose syphilis can look like it. I mean, it's got diffuse symmetric lesions. Uh, Sarcoidosis, you got to think about cutaneous lymphoma, cutaneous microses. Okay. So what about the genetic epidemiology of leprosy? And you know, first off, really, just how does leprosy get around anyway? Um, there is some genotyping of leprosy strains that has taken place, mostly in China. Um, they they have a variety of tandem repeat polymorphisms, single nucleotide point polymorphisms, and so they've been able to identify genotypic clusters. And of interest, um, the same organism in one village tends to appear in other villages that are nearby, with this idea that there probably is a person-to-person -person spread in household with extension into the local villages, suggesting that there's person-to-person -person distribution, which is useful. Um, okay, and finally, leprosy is a disease of chronic physical disability. Once you lose those nerves, um, then uh, you have lifelong uh, injuries, and I'll give you, um, also with a loss of uh, uh, pain sensation, and loss of nerve and motor function. So the neuridides of leprosy are very important. Uh, typically involved are ulnar median uh, popliteal posterior tibial nerves. Uh, this result in loss of sensation, and you have some real characteristics deform characteristic deformities. Uh, for the ulnar nerve, it's the benediction sign. Now, you got it. <laughs> She's a true Catholic. Okay, um, claw hand. It's called claw hand. I, I'm not really convinced it's like looks like a claw, but craw. Okay, and the radio nerve, and that's wrist drop. So just a few more pictures. Uh, this is benediction hand. Um, this is not leprosy. You can see the scar in this guy's uh, palm. He's obviously severed his uh, uh, nerve there. Uh, this is known as ape hand, which is a lesion from uh, from the median nerve. And essential, I think that's right. Yeah, median nerve, because median nerve lets your thumb do its business. And so the thumb kind of rests on top of this. And I guess it's supposed to look like an ape hand, I guess. Yeah, they do, but they don't have the opposable thumb. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they cannot adapt. The, that's right. The apes cannot adapt. Yeah. And they feel very they feel very bad about that. <laughs> That's I mean, why we're human. That's don't, the only difference. Don't ever tell Ape that <laughs> you don't have opposable thumbs. You know? They get angry. Look at that. <laughs> All right. All right, another iPod can kind of set it down the tubes here. Um, okay, and so uh, and this is of course radio and uh, wrist drops. Yes. And finally, if you lose sensation, you get these terrible ulcers. It's like pressure sores in our uh, spinal cord patients downstairs. Bad stuff. Okay, so treatment. Um, WHO has a pretty straightforward cookie-cutter approach to this. They treat with two drugs, rifampin and dapsone, if it's posibacillary leprosy, one to five skin lesions, and they go for six months. Um, that's how it started out. Um, just a minute. Yeah, I, I, for some reason, pieces of this kind of fell out. Okay, for multibacillary leprosy, you instead will use a combination of rifampindapsone and clofazamine. Um, the reason for adding clofazamine, it is, it is a uh, bactericidal drug. What's, it is useful because clofazamine also has some anti-inflammatory properties. And when you're dealing with lepromonas, uh, leprosy, you, you get these reactions where, in fact, you might want some anti-inflammatories on board. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. When you get down to the, how do we know that antibiotics are bacteriostatic or bactericidal for mycobacterium libri? You can't grow them in, in uh, tissue cap culture. You can't grow them on plates. So what can you do? A mouse foot pad. But not any mouse foot pad. <laughs> This is a, uh, I think they use nude mouse for this, which is a mouse that doesn't have skin. You may be wondering why there isn't skin on this mouse. Uh, excuse me, uh, hair on this mouse. And that's a nude mouse. And uh, the defect there also destroys your T-cell function. So if you don't have T-cells, you can't fight leprosy. So basically these are just uh, organisms that, these mice are just incredibly susceptible to leprosy. Uh, and you can actually count the number of organisms. You can treat them with antibiotics. And you can actually get a fair idea of what's, what's um, 
uh, how the antibiotics work. <clears throat> okay, uh, there are other options, linazolid, uh, some of the fluoroquinolones. Um, they don't they're not really used that much, so. Okay. And once you treat, usually the lesions start to melt away. It takes a while. If it's, if it's a um, tuberculoid, usually it's pretty quick to do well. The neuropathy will not recover. If it's been destroyed, it's gone. Uh, for lepromatous leprosy, you may be talking three years' worth of therapy uh, with uh, three drugs, and you just have to be patient with that. Um, this is a process <coughs> called the skin slit. You actually cut a little bit of the ear. You can actually count the number of cells that the bacteria that are there. Some people have training where they think they can actually identify dead or live mycobacterium um, uh, leprae. Uh, I think John Tony somewhere along the line got some training in that, so we can ask about it one of these days. Okay, but eventually this patient will recover, um, but in the process of treating them, you have these very unusual treatment-related complications. One is reversal reaction. This is mostly for borderline tuberculosis or uh, lepromatous patients, and they suddenly get this nuance and inflammation. You, you're treating them, things are going fine, and boom, they have fevers, they feel terrible, they have arthralgias, and they have these their, uh, areas where they have leprosy have actually now become very inflammatory. Um, basically, all the T cells wake up and they start attacking the bacteria. Now, if you have bacteria in your nerve, you're in big trouble because there's going to be a very rapid uh, potential irreversible neuritis. So it's it's a uh, it's an emergency. And so, what do you do? What we always do when you, know, you get a uh, uh, iris response is that you essentially um, try and inhibit the uh, mediators of that. Turns out, in some of the more recent literature, that um, Okay, so you have the reversal response, and then the other one is the erythema and the dodosum leprosum. And this was thought to be more of an antibody antigen complex disease, but it turns out it's that, but also um, it's also mediated by T cells uh, making TNF alpha. And in the serum, you can actually measure TNF alpha in the one to four nanograms per mil range, which actually haven't worked massively with this. That, that's a lot of TNF. Um, I think most people would be uh, uh, symptomatic with that. <clears throat> So treatment is short course uh, steroids um, or thalidomide, of course, contraindicated in pregnancy. Thalidomide is interesting because it actually inhibits the production of TNF and a couple of other pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it's, it's gaining more acceptance as an uh, anti-inflammatory drug in a variety of diseases. Uh, thalidomide does make a big difference in this disease uh, because, remember, you're, you're treating the bacteria. So the bacteria is going away. So you're treating the primary cause of disease. Right now, though, is you're just trying to get rid of the inflammation. So here's a patient, and this is erythema nodosum leprosum, um, <clears throat> and this is him um, over a period of time. And when you get to the right, it looks like things are a lot more normal now. You don't have these bumps. You don't have <coughs> all that's inflammatory signs. So thalidomide actually works very well in this situation, which is why <coughs> uh, people can still get access to thalidomide. Okay, can it be eradicated? WHO, uh, back in the year 2000, said, oh, yeah, we can do this. Um, but no, it didn't work out. Um, mass chemotherapy has been tried. The problem is you're going to have to wait 10 years before you even know if you're making any difference at all. That's very hard when you're trying to fund a program and everyone else wants your money for other funding other programs, which may actually be more worthwhile. Um, it's not entirely certain that they're going to be able to finish these studies. There's enormous political pressure to use some of these funds elsewhere. That's a typical kind of worldwide WHO problem. Um, there, there is a clear-cut sense that there's a genetic susceptibility to leprosy. You know, why do you have lepromatous disease? Why do you have tuberculoid disease? And there's been a suggestion that there are some mutations in TOLEC receptor 2. Now, remember, TOLEC receptor 2 is a, um, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, a pathogen-associated molecular pattern <coughs> recognition receptor. Um, and the total receptor 2 tends to recognize things associated with gram-positive bacteria. And to some extent, mycobacteria is, a, is like a gram-positive pathogen. It detects that, signals uh, T cells to do what they need to do. However, there are point mutations in it, and uh, the one I'm pointing out here to R677W, where R replaces W or vice versa, that does not signal very well. So these patients, this, this particular um, allele has been dis uh, shown in a number of patients with lepromatous disease with a sense of that they're just not capable to really attack the mycobacteria as well. So then um, you get more of a prominence disease. Uh, tumor necrosis factor, of course, is produced and probably has some activity against leprosy. Again, there's an association between different alleles that might make subtle differences in the outcome. Uh, 
And there's a few other things there. Um, the only one that's of interest is NRAP because NRAP is just a, it's a porn. <clears throat> and the fatal lysosome of the macrophage. And defects in NRAP <coughs> signaling are associated with <coughs> excuse me, increased risk of salmonellosis, listeriosis, um, intracellular fungi, histoplasmosis, anything that's intracellular. So there's something about that uh, very large gene that is absolutely essential for killing intracellular pathogens. <clears throat> there is a thought that people have tried a leprosy vaccine, hasn't really worked. Turns out it probably was in front of us the whole time, just wasn't noticed. Uh, in areas with high levels of BCG vaccination, uh, there's evidence that there's anywhere from 20 to 80 percent protection against development of uh, uh, leuclomonous leprosy. Um, recent case control studies in Brazil showed about 54 percent protection, which is actually better than the protection you'd expect to get from uh, 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 TB using the same vaccine. Uh, and it's of interest in that there is this association with um, villages that are very poor, uh, you know, that have like dirt uh, floors and everything. They're the ones that tend to have the highest rates of leprosy leprosy as the kids grow up. Um, <clears throat> it also turns out in these same countries, mostly Brazil, where they do these studies, um, the poorest families don't get BCG when they deliver uh, when they deliver children. What happens is the kids are delivered, there's no doctor in attendance, there's no BCG vaccine. So Brazilians, going back and looking at this, realized that anyone who had a single dose of BCG when they were born were protected against uh, uh, leprosy, and that it's probably the you know, and associated, and it probably accounts for why there's an association with an increased risk of leprosy in poor uh, families. It's probably because they're not getting that BCG vaccine. So it begins to make some sense. And uh, I think there's increasing interest in maybe using BCG as a dedicated uh, leprosy vaccine at some point. Lots of leprosy in literature. Uh, Graham Greene burnout cases went classic. Why? Uh, Sidney Maurice Levinson was a, an American. Um, a Texan who developed a leprosy, performance leprosy, around 1912 or so. And he was put into the Carville uh, Leprosorium. And he wrote this great little novel about it and, you know, the exploits they had. And frankly, when they were in the Leprosorium, they could leave any time they want. There were holes to the, uh, the defense, and they'd sneak out and go into town, and there were some bars in town that had a back room where anyone from the leprosy colony could go and drink. <laughs> And they had marriages. They had a, a chapel uh, in, in Carville. And uh, at some point when they all got treated, uh, they stayed because that was home. And they had families there and, and the whole thing. So it's really quite an interesting little just sort of insight into how people get along. All right. I think that's about it. And here's the armadillo, the mighty, mighty armadillo. Um, Interesting critter, it can hold its breath for something like five minutes, and when it wants to go it across the stream, it can't actually swim. It, it basically crawls along the bottom of the stream because up the other side. Or it can inflate itself with a lot of air and float itself across. And interesting, when they um, give birth, they give birth to four identical uh, babies. All the same sex, <clears throat> genetically identical. It's just a way that they, there's a one primordial egg, it splits four ways, and that's what that's how it works out.